G'day, this is Chris Savage from Ariel Ministries in Australia, welcoming you to this session of the Messiah, the First Coming Prophecies. I pray that it will be of benefit to you and help you in your Christian growth. Thank you for coming along. So welcome to this. This is the first session of the First Coming Prophecies of the Messiah. Uh, so it's a new study we've should have done. Uh, this is going to be a survey of all the Messianic prophecies in the Hebrew scriptures, which were fulfilled at the first coming of Messiah. Uh, we're not looking at the second coming at uh, this time. The Orthodox Jewish interpretation of these uh, does not um, expect Messiah to come twice, but rather, uh, as we will see later on in this study, uh, they expect two Messiahs, each coming once. So what we're going to look at here is we're going to do this study from a Messianic Jewish perspective, uh, and we, it's going to be shown here that the Hebrew prophecies were fulfilled in the life of Jesus or Yeshua and cannot be fulfilled in any other way. And the Gospels make it very clear that Jesus' death took the apostles by surprise. In fact, their confusion arose largely because of their lack of knowledge concerning the full program of the Messiah. They had fully expected Jesus to overthrow their enemies, and he's going to establish his kingdom on earth at that time. They were very familiar with the prophecies concerning that aspect of his messianic kingdom, that he was going to overthrow the government and rule. Ah, what they failed to grasp, though, was that Messiah had to come twice. First to suffer, and then later he will come uh, to victory. So the purpose of his first coming was quite different from the purpose of his second coming. Yeah, you know, in order that we can substantiate the purpose of his first coming, Jesus uh, does not ask his disciples to simply believe. He just he didn't say, you know, just believe me when I tell you. And they didn't do that. But actually, he referred them back to the authority of their own Hebrew scriptures, what you know, what, what we call the Old Testament, it's the Hebrew scriptures. So we're going to look at the New Testament use of the Old Testament. This is just in, re in relation to how the Old Testament was used to present the gospel. We have a couple of examples here. One of the examples, how it's used, we look in, in Luke uh, chapter 24, verses 25 to 27, and uh, chapter 44, sorry, Luke 25, 44 to 48. Uh, I'm just going to read most of this, not all of it. So 24, verse 25, and he said to them, this is Jesus, O foolish men and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? And here we go, beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. Now moving on to verse 44, now he said to them, these are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, thus it is written, the Christ should suffer and rise again from the dead the third day, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning for Jerusalem. And you guys are witnesses of these things. So, he, uh, on the Emmaus Road, in one of his resurrection appearances, Jesus reproaches his disciples for not knowing all that the prophets spoke, including the prophecies concerning his suffering and death. Now, they had no difficulty believing the prophecies which presented Messiah as a reigning king because, you know, he was there present with them. So, whoa, we're going to be part of the kingdom. Uh, and, you know, he was going to restore Israel to their former glory. But they had great difficulty in accepting uh, those prophecies which foretold of Messiah's suffering and death. And the fact that the disciples were so distraught by Jesus' arrest and crucifixion shows that they were really in a state of unbelief. They, they, they just simply couldn't believe it. Now, we are told that Jesus began with the law of Moses, moved on to the prophets, and went through all of the Hebrew scriptures. And that was to show the disciples all of the things concerning the Messiah. So he was then able to prove that his death and resurrection were perfectly in accordance with Scripture. 
and essential to his work, which was proving his messiahship. Now, in the most ancient sources to modern rabbis today, Jewish teachers have always divided the scriptures into three sections. We have the law, the prophets, and the writings. Now, <clears throat> we see here just in, in, the, Luke, uh, in, in the Luke passage where uh, in verse 44, Jesus does the same. Um, but here he says the writings, he calls it the Psalms. Uh, the writings are sometimes uh, referred to only as the Psalms. Why? Because the Psalms is the first book in the writings. Now, Jesus systematically covers all scripture revealing to his disciples all things concerning himself. Now, all things include prophecies of the second coming, which are still yet to be fulfilled, um, as well as prophecies concerning the first coming, which were being fulfilled at the time uh, that, uh, that Jesus was speaking. And so by bringing together prophecies from all three sections of Jewish scripture, Jesus is then able to prove that it was necessary for him to be killed, buried, and raised again on the third day. Now, I've just given you a breakdown uh, of the law. Uh, uh, that's the first uh, five, that's the Torah. Uh, that's the first five books in their Bible. We have Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Then we go into the prophets, which are called the Nevi'im. And we have Joshua, Judges, 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st, 2nd Kings, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and the minors, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. That's the prophets, the Nevi'im. And we have the writings, which are the Psalms, Proverbs, Job, they're the wisdom books in, in the writings. And we have the Song of Songs, and then we have Ruth, Lamentations, Ecclesiastes, Esther, Daniel, Ezra, Nehemiah, First and Second Chronicles. It's interesting that they have uh, Daniel in the writings, even though, I mean, it, it, he is a prophet because Jesus says, he, he refers to him as the prophet Daniel, but uh, uh, in the Jewish scriptures, they have him um, in the writing section. Now, Jesus' followers learned their lesson well from Jesus because later on in the New Testament, after Jesus' ascension, we see that the disciples repeatedly justified and authenticated Jesus' messiahship to Gentiles as well as Jews, and they used the Hebrew scriptures because at the time the New Testament wasn't written. And we see in Acts chapter 8, verse 26 to 29, for instance, this is the story of the Ethiopian eunuch, a eunuch, 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 who is reading the prophecy of Isaiah 53. And Philip is sent to explain to him the meaning of the prophecy. And we read in verse 53, uh, beginning from this scripture, in Isaiah 53, beginning from this scripture, we see Philip preached Jesus to him. Yeah. Beginning, uh, so that was we read in, in verse 35 of Acts chapter 8. Beginning with Isaiah 53, a passage which we're going to look at uh, quite a bit later on in this study. Philip is able to present the messiahship of Jesus. And the Ethiopian eunuch is so impressed by the way in which Jesus' suffering and death fits Isaiah's description of the messianic person. He's, he's just so impressed by it that he's convinced and immediately becomes a believer. And now the second example is Acts chapter 7. Excuse me. Is Acts chapter 17, verses 1 to 4. And here uh, we see that Paul's procedure in the synagogue was to expand on the scriptures, meaning scripture of the Old Testament, and specifically the messianic prophecies, which we should be studying later on. Now, having portrayed the kind of Messiah that the scriptures demanded, he was then able to show how Jesus <clears throat> perfectly fits the messianic mold of the Old Testament. Third example again is in Acts 18, verse 27 to 28. Here again. We see Apollos, his method of debating with the Jewish leaders was to go back to the scriptures and prove how Jesus satisfied the requirements of Hebrew prophecy. Now, one final example we see in Acts 28, verse 23, Paul is here debating with the Jewish leaders in Rome. 
And it's evidence, once again, does not rest on Matthew, uh, Mark, Luke, or John, but it rests on the scriptures of the Old Testament, the, 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 the Torah, the, the, the prophets, and the writings. There is, in fact, no mention of the Gospels. Why? It hadn't been written as yet. Now, in this particular situation, Paul rests his case exclusively on the law and the prophets. Now, Jesus used all three sections of the Old Testament because as far, as far as he and the apostles were concerned, all of the Hebrew scriptures were of equal validity. Now, we have four categories of messianic prophecy, which I just want to quickly look at. Four types. When we're dealing with messianic prophecy, it's very important to understand that there are four categories of messianic prophecy. And these distinctions are essential for us to understand the future prophecies. The four categories are the first coming only, example, Micah 5.2. Then we have the second coming only, Isaiah 63, 1-6. Then we have birth first and com second coming, uh, Zechariah chapter 9, verses 9 to 10 is an example of that. And then we have prophecies regarding the entire redemptive career and Psalm 110, we find that. So some prophecies are very straightforward and deal exclusively with either the first coming and category one or the second coming category two. Uh, here we see in the first coming, Messiah will be born in Bethlehem, city of David. That's not how, that's the first coming prophecy. Second coming, we see is Messiah's day of vengeance, where he delivers the remnant of Israel from a place called Bosra. That's in Isaiah 63. So that's the second coming only. Now, the, the third category of prophecies include verses that blend the first and second comings together in such a way that it's very difficult uh, uh, it, to find out what's going on uh, because, you know, it, it doesn't give you that thing. It doesn't give you that clear thing. Um, so it becomes necessary then to study other parallel scriptures in order to see the distinction between the first coming and the second coming in that passage. Now, as I said before, Zechariah uh, chapter 9, verses 9 and 10 is a very good example of this. Verse 9 deals with the first coming. Verse 10 deals with the second coming. So these verses uh, alone do not distinguish between the two because they're just so they're together. But this is clarified by other passages uh, as we're going to see later on. Fourth category refers to passages uh, which cover the entire Messianic program and include four elements. It, it includes the first coming, it includes an interval of time, it includes a second coming, and it includes the Messianic kingdom. And uh, that one is Psalm 110. Now, <clears throat> If we can understand the first coming prophecies and the ways in which they were fulfilled, that will help us to understand and, and correctly interpret the second coming prophecies. Because all first coming prophecies were fulfilled in a literal way and not allegorically or, or spiritually, as some people uh, expound. We should then, if, if all the first coming prophecies are literal, then we should expect the second coming prophecies to be fulfilled in the very same way, and that is literally. And that's exactly what we believe. Now, we saw that the Messianic prophecies of the Hebrew scriptures form the basis for evangelism in the New Testament. <clears throat> and then we had first, we had Jesus with the disciples, and then the disciples themselves used the Old Testament to substantiate his claim to be the Messiah. And uh, when the messianic expectations of Hebrew prophecy are understood, it becomes very clear that Jesus and only Jesus can fulfill these requirements. Nobody else can. It is Yeshua. He is the Messiah. So these then are the scriptures that we're going to study, and we're going to examine them in the same context and, and categories that Jesus and the apostles did. We're going to look at them in the law the prophets, and the writings. Remember the law? Law is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. The first prophecy we're going to look at is in the first 
uh, in the first three chapters of, of Genesis, we have Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. It's the first prophecy. We have the seed of the woman. And I, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. Now, <clears throat> Messianic prophecy begins as early as the third chapter of the book of Genesis. Why? Because the reason we have the very first messianic prophecy here, because it, it occurs within the context of the fall, the fall of man. If sin had not entered the world, there would be, never have been any need for a redeeming Messiah. So we had sin in chapter two. Now we have in chapter three, we have the promise of a redeemer. So after the fall, God curses the serpent who had caused the fall. And he declares enmity between the serpent and womanhood. And this enmity is to extend to her seed, meaning the seed of the woman and your seed or the seed of the serpent. So we have two seeds here, the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. The seed of the woman refers to Christ the Messiah. And the seed of the serpent will then be the Antichrist. Now, this is the first messianic prophecy, and this declares Messiah's descent, his, his uh, genealogy, is going to be reckoned after a woman, not a man. This is very unusual. There are a lot of genealogies in scripture, beginning with the earliest one in Genesis chapter 5, and then uh, chapter 10, and then through the first uh, nine chapters of First Chronicles, and then we have one in Matthew 1 and then Luke 3. You know, virtually all of these genealogies are lists of men's names. Legal descent, national and tribal identity was always taken from the father and never from the mother. Well, there is, there is one sole exception to this, actually, and that's found in Ezra uh, chapter. 2 verse 61 and Nehemiah chapter 7 verse 63, both talking about the same, uh, same incident, the daughters of, of Barzillai. So it's very rare that a woman's name would actually be included at all in a genealogy unless she figured very prominently in Jewish history. And even then, she would warrant only a passing reference. So the fact that Moses traced this genealogy through the woman tells us that there will be something very different about the Messiah. Something that necessitates tracing his ancestry through his mother and not through his father. Moses doesn't give us an explanation here either. And in fact, because he wouldn't have known. In fact, none will be given for several centuries until the time of the prophet Isaiah. When he's going to prophesy in Isaiah chapter 7, that Messiah is to be born of a virgin and he's not going to have a human father. So the virgin birth hinted at in this verse, chapter three, verse 15 of Genesis also implies the humanity of the Messiah. So what we know is that the Redeemer Messiah will not be angelic nor purely divine, but will be a man. So Genesis 3.15 lays the groundwork for the Messiah to be the God-man. Uh, and these we're going to develop further on as, as we get into it in more prophecies. Genesis 3.15 states that the Messiah, the seed of the woman, would bruise your head, meaning he would crush the head of the serpent, that's Satan. Uh, we find it from Revelation 12 verse 9. And in the process, Satan will manage to bruise him on the heel, but he'll be unable to prevent its, his own destruction. The bruising of Messiah's heel, when did that happen? Well, it took place at the crucifixion. It was painful, but in the eternal sense, it was not fatal. The crushing of the serpent's head began with Jesus' death and resurrection, and that's a point made by Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 to 18. Romans chapter 16, verse 20, sees the crushing of Satan's head as still something future. And so 
His final destruction will not come until he's thrown into the lake of fire, as described in Revelation chapter 20, verse 10. If you have the notes here, I think I put Revelation 20, verse 2 or verse 20. You might have to change those notes. Now, how was this first messianic prophecy understood by Adam and Eve? A study of the passages shows that the virgin birth would not be understood until Isaiah. However, the expectation of a God-man redeemer was understood because Genesis chapter 4, verse 1, uh, we see in, in, that, in that passage, a, a literal translation of the Hebrew text for Genesis 4, 1 would read, And the man knew Eve, his wife, she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man. Jehovah. So Eve clearly understood from God's words in Genesis 3.15 that the serpent will be defeated by a God-man. She obviously thought that Cain is Jehovah. Her basic theology was correct. Messiah would be both man and God. But her application was a little bit askew, was a little bit off. It was wrong. She assumed that Cain, her first child, was the promised God-man. Now, it goes on to say, again, she bare his brother Abel. So she quickly realized her mistake, and it's evident at the birth of Cain's brother, whom she named Abel, meaning vanity. So her belief that Cain was the God-man, was the Messiah, uh, was vanity. Now, in Genesis 6, verses 1 to 4, um, human, human creatures were not the only ones to understand the meaning and the significance of God's words in Genesis 3.15. Satan, uh, to whom those words were addressed, also understood them. Because in Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 to 4, we see Satan's first attempt to thwart God's messianic program. Now, since Messiah is to be the seed of the woman, Satan's objective must be to corrupt this line of descent. And in, in, uh, in chapter 6, verse 1 to 4, it says this. Now, it came about when men began to multiply in the face of the land and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful and they took wives for themselves, whomever they chose. Then the Lord said, my spirit shall not strive with man forever because he also is flesh. Nevertheless, his days shall be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they brought children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Now, just briefly, we're going to look at this, these four verses. In order to corrupt the seed of the woman, at Satan's command, fallen evil angels, which are the sons of God, intermarry with human women. And that was foreshadowing the supernatural conception of the Antichrist, also seen in Genesis 3.15. Throughout the Old Testament, the term sons of God is always used of angels. This is a very this is very clear when the usages of the term are compared in the Old Testament. Elsewhere, we see the term is used in Job chapter 1, verse 6, and chapter 2, verse 1. Job 1, 6, Job 2, 1, and Job 38, verse 7. Job 38, 7, where sons of God is found in the, wherever it's found in the Old Testament, it clearly refers to angels. Second key expression in verse 2 is daughters of men. This is a generic term for women. Now, why did Satan have some of his fallen angels intermarry with human women? Why bother? Three chapters earlier in Genesis 3.15, the first messianic prophecy is recorded. This prophecy declared that the Messiah would be the seed of the woman, and this seed would crush the head of Satan. Therefore, what's happening in Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 to 4, is a satanic attempt to corrupt the seed of the woman by having some of his angels take on human form, angels always appear as young males when they take on human form, and intermarry with humankind to try to corrupt the seed. So the events of Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 to 4, were a satanic attempt to cancel out the prophecy of Genesis 
The results of these marriages were grotesque creatures called the Nephilim. If the Holy Spirit would not continue to strive with this kind of evil forever, and God decreed the destruction of humanity to be fulfilled 120 years later. And the means of destruction would be the flood. The purpose of the flood was to destroy the product of the union of angels and women. And it was the appearance of these uh, uh, creatures which brought upon the earth the flood. And by means of the flood, God destroyed all the Nephilim and preserved the line through which Messiah would be born. And that line would be through Noah. Now, that's just a very brief uh, study on Gen Genesis 1 to 4, but it, it, to do with the, with the concept of what we're doing here today. Now, what do we learn from Genesis 3.15? Well, Genesis 3.15 teaches us that the Messiah comes from humanity. Therefore, he is human. He's a man. Genesis 22, verse 18, we have the seed of Saint, seed of Abraham, not, not Satan, seed of Abraham. Yeah. <clears throat> now, Genesis 22, along with many other passages, deals with the Abrahamic covenant, which is one of the eight covenants in Scripture. In Genesis 22, 18, and in your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you've obeyed my voice. And this is God talking to Abraham. And the term seed in the, Hebrew, in the Hebrew text is always used in the singular, but it's used in the singular in two different ways. It can be used as an absolute singular, so that means it's referring to one individual person, or it can be used as a collective singular referring to a group. Now, within the context of the Abrahamic covenant, when seed is used in its collective sense, it always refers to the nation of Israel. An example of this is Genesis 22, 17, which says, your seed shall be as the stars and the sand. So when used, that's, that's when it's used as a, as a collective singular, when used as an absolute singular, it refers to one specific individual, and that is Messiah. How do we know that? Well, it's highlighted for us by the Apostle Paul in the New Testament. Now, the promise, this is in Galatians 3, verse 16. Now, the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say, and to seeds, as referring to many, but rather to one and to your seed, that is Messiah. That's, Genesis, that's Galatians 3, verse 16. So here, Paul quotes Genesis 22, verse 18, highlighting the absolute singular nature of seed and applying it to Messiah. Second point made in this prophecy is that Gentiles, which are the nations, will be blessed through the seed of Abraham. Uh, he doesn't explain it back in Genesis 22, but uh, Isaiah will explain it to us later on in Isaiah 42, 1 to 6, and Isaiah 49, 5 to 6, when we get there. So in Genesis 3, 15, we learn that Messiah would be the seed of the woman, Messiah would be human. Now, with the Abrahamic covenant, this is narrowed to Messiah being a descendant of one particular branch of humanity, a descendant of Abraham. So we're narrowing it down. Now, in Genesis 49, verse 10, we're going to see he's going to be the seed of Judah, or going to come from the seed of Judah. Genesis 49 describes the prophecies proclaimed by Jacob concerning his sons. Now, in 49, verse 10, Jacob prophesies, the scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until he comes to whom it belongs and the obedience of the nations is his. So in verse 10 of Genesis 49, he makes a prophetic statement concerning Judah. That's one of the tribes. The basic meaning of this statement is that Judah will not lose its tribal identity or its right to rule over the other tribes until someone comes. Now, who's the someone? Well, a more literal translation, uh, translation of the verse would read, the scepter will not depart, the scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until he comes, whose right it is, and unto him shall the obedience of the peoples be. Genesis 49.10 and Messiah's first coming, we can see that this verse makes three points. Now, we know that Messiah has previously been declared to be a man, 
descended from Abraham. His descent is now limited to being the son of Judah or being a son of Judah. A second point is that Messiah is going to be a king. The scepter and the ruler's staff indicate royalty and authority. Third, it should be seen that Messiah must come before the tribe of Judah loses its identity. So we obviously now have a, a clear time period for this prophecy to happen. Judah's identity and right to rule cannot be lost until one comes who has full rights to the scepter, full rights to rule. Now, how would Judah lose its tribal identity? Well, the records by which tribal identities were maintained were kept in the Jewish temple. And these records were lost with the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. Immediately after, the rabbis passed laws which would preserve the identity of the priestly tribe of Levi. But Jews from the other tribes lost their identity within a few generations because they didn't have any more records. And since the tribe of Judah lost its preeminence and identity in AD 70, it can be clearly seen that Messiah must have come sometime before AD 70. It is simply not possible for Messiah to come after AD 70. Now, this verse has been consistently regarded by the rabbis as being a messianic verse. For example, the Targum of Onquelas, which is an Aramaic translation, translated as, the transmission of dominion shall not cease from the house of Judah, nor the scribe from his children's children forever, until the Messiah comes to whom the kingdom belongs and whom nations shall obey. So, so this, uh, this man on Quellus clearly saw this, uh, this verse as messianic. So Genesis 49 teaches that the seed of the woman and the seed of Abraham is now limited to being of the specific tribe of Judah and teaches us also that Messiah will be a king, teaches us also that Messiah had to come before 70 AD. Numbers 23 and 24, we have the predictions of Balaam, or Balaam, whatever you want to call him, Balaam. Now, Numbers uh, chapter 22 and 24 present us with the story of Balaam. Balaam was a Gentile astrologer. He was a seer. He came from the region around about uh, Babylonia. He established a considerable reputation for himself right throughout the ancient world. In fact, it was widely regarded that he whom Balaam cursed was cursed, and he whom Balaam blessed was blessed. Uh, we find it in Numbers 22, verse 6. Now, when Balaam's on the scene, or Balaam's on the scene, it's, uh, it's when we have the exodus from Egypt, uh, the Israelites have arrived in the border of Moab, and they're about to enter the promised land. And uh, Baal looks upon them and he says, my gosh, there's a lot of them down there. So the king of Moab, he, uh, one of the early anti-Semites of history, he, he didn't like this idea. He didn't like the prospect of new neighbors, and he decided to take some action. He called for Balaam and commissioned him for a considerable amount of money to come and curse the Jews. Remember, he whom Balaam cursed is cursed, so his reputation preceded him, offered a lot of money. Now, Balaam tries very hard to fulfill this commission. But every time he opens his mouth to pronounce curses, God takes control of his tongue and he finds himself blessing the Jews instead. Now, he, off, he, 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 he utters or he, he, he gives us four oracles and these are put in his mouth by God. And they deal for the most part with the second coming of Messiah and his kingdom. However, there are a few things which we're going to need to look at. So we look at them. The first oracle we find is in Numbers, 20, uh, Numbers 23, verses 7 to 10. Uh, in, in verse 8, Balaam says this, How shall I curse whom God has not cursed? And how can I denounce whom the Lord has not denounced. So Balaam points out in verse 8 that he is unable to curse those whom God has not cursed. 
they sometimes said that Israel's enjoyment of divine blessings is dependent on her obedience. But at this point in her history, Israel is in disobedience. Yet despite that, God is still watching over her. Regardless of her obedience or disobedience, Israel will always be God's chosen and covenant people. God will never permit Gentiles to put curses on Israel such that they would be of eternal effect, which Balaam's would have been. So God therefore intervenes in this situation and overrules the intentions of men. In verse 9, as I see him from the top of the rocks and I look at him from the hills, behold, a people who dwells apart and shall not be reckoned among the nations. Now, a second point we need to look at here in verse 9 is that Israel will not be considered a nation. Now, this is Balaam speaking here. Uh, throughout much of their history, the Jewish people have been unable to live in a land of their own. And while the land of Cain or, or Palestine, the land of, land of Israel, belongs to the Jews by divine right, their ability to occupy the land has been largely dependent on their obedience to God. Now, to man, from man's perspective, a people without a land cannot be a nation, which is why in verse 9, it says they dwell alone, not reckoned among the nations. So from the divine viewpoint, however, the people of Israel will always be a distinct nation. It makes no difference whatsoever whether Israel is in the land or scattered abroad. Why? Because God sees Israel not as the people of a particular place, but as the nation which is descended from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So it's not where they live that makes them a nation. It's their descendant or their ancestry that makes them a nation. That's why Jewish identity is determined by descent. Jewishness is not determined by place of birth or by religious beliefs, but purely by ancestry. You're a Jew who is descended from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, as Balaam prophetically looks forward to the future of this nation, he sees that God's final destiny for them is one of supreme blessing. In, in, in the first part of verse 10, who can count the dust of Jacob or number the fourth part of Israel? So Balaam sees that God's final destiny for them is one of supreme blessing. And then he goes on to say in the second part of verse 10, let me die the death of the upright and let my end be like his, that is, be like Israel's. And here he expresses his desire to share in that blessing that Israel, that supreme blessing that Israel is going to have in the future. The second oracle we find in Numbers 23, verses 18 to 24. And there are two key points made in this passage, and it's mainly in verse 21. Um, in verse 21, he says, he has not observed misfortune in Jacob, nor has he seen trouble in Israel. The Lord, his God, is with him, and the shout of a king is among them. Now, Balaam sees a time in the future when Israel as a nation will be seen as sinless. He has not observed any misfortune in Jacob, nothing wrong with Jacob, nor trouble in Israel. Second, Balaam says that during this time of sinlessness, God himself will be present as king. Now, these prophecies relate to the second coming of Messiah, but it should still be noted here that God will be present and rule in the midst of his people one day. The third oracle is in Numbers 24, verses 3 to 9. Two points are emphasized here. The first is a description of the future condition of Israel as one of supreme blessing. The second <clears throat> highlights the future condition of Israel's king. <clears throat> that's, <clears throat> that's verse, the second part of verse 7. 
Having introduced the uniqueness of the nation of Israel in the first oracle, the second and third oracles go on to emphasize the uniqueness of the king who will one day rule over this nation. How fair, uh, verse 5 uh, and, and onwards uh, to 7 verse says this, How fair are your tents, O Jacob, your dwellings, O Israel, like valleys that stretch out, like gardens beside the river, like aloes planted by the Lord, like cedars beside the waters. Water shall flow from his buckets and his seed shall be by many waters. Here we go. And his king shall be higher than Agag, and his kingdom shall be exalted. Uh, verse 8 goes on to say, God brings him out of Egypt. He's, he is for him like the horns of the wallet. He says here, he shall devour the nations who are his adversaries and shall crush their bones in pieces and shatter them with his arrows. It says he, he couches, he lies in as a lion and as a lion who dares rouse him. Blessed is everyone who blesses you and cursed is everyone who curses you. So, we see that his Israel's king will be higher than Agag and his kingdom will be exalted. Now, Agag is a, it was the official title of all the kings of Amalek, um, very similar to the, the term Pharaoh or even the term Abimelech. So he will be above them all. The fourth oracle we see in Numbers 24, verses 15 to 24. In verse, first part of verse 17, verse 17a, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come forth from Jacob, and a scepter shall rise from Israel. It is the fourth of the oracles which is of greatest interest in our study of the first coming prophecies. The key prophecy is in verse 17, the first part. And it builds on the prophecy already given in Genesis 49, verse 10. A star shall come forth from Jacob, that is, come forth from Israel. And coupled with this star is a scepter, which we see in Genesis 49, 10, represents kingship, since he who has the scepter has the right to rule. So the message here from Balaam is that Messiah will be a king. And as we shall see, Messiah has three offices. One of them is a king. Balaam began his oracles by emphasizing the unique nature of the nation of Israel. He then went on to say that this nation, though scattered at first, would have a unique king to rule over it. And he finishes here by declaring the awesome power of this king and noting in verse 17 that his coming would be heralded by the appearance of a star. The significance of the closing words of chapter 24 should not be missed. Having completed his work, Balaam the Babylonian astrologer returns to my people, which is in verse 14 of 24, and to his place in verse 25. And with him, he takes the prophecy of a star back to Babylon, announcing the birth of a unique and powerful king who will rule over Israel. So what did Numbers 24 verse 17 teach us? It teaches us that Messiah is to be a king. And that is where we're going to leave it for this session. Thank you for coming along. I pray that this would have opened our eyes a little bit more to Messiah. Study hard and grow strong.